Well, welcome to another Fibre Laser Learning Lab. Um, we finished off the last session with a quick sort of scattergun approach to checking whether or not we could get any sort of colours on stainless steel. We got these results, but these are an enhanced Photoshop picture of my photograph, and they exaggerate the colours quite considerably. I mean, I looked at all these speeds and frequencies to see whether or not there was any uh, pulse rate or on-off ratio that I could mix together to get some sort of idea of whether or not I was getting into the right sort of region to get between these colours here, I mean the gold and the blue. After a lot of time spent hunting for some magic numbers, everything was common here except the speed. And at a speed of 500 I got gold and a speed of 200, I got blue-ish. As I said, this is a gross exaggeration of reality, but it was a bluey hue that I got. So it seemed as though speed was the magic number. Now I have to also add that for six nanoseconds, which was the critical factor that I was using, I wasn't actually using the correct peak power. I should have actually been using 320 kilohertz for peak power. So 400 kilohertz means I'm running faster than I should do. So that probably means that I'm not allowing all the electrons to be promoted to their excited state before I push the pulse through and try and, and, try and get to peak power. So that probably gives me another way of controlling the power into each pulse. So we've got several strategies that we can adopt. I think the last time we looked at it, we found that this gold one here um, was actually caused by lines, and in the lines we were finding gold patterns. So what this tends to indicate is that my little pattern of interference colours, which as you can see I've managed to get them back by using um, not daylight, but halogen work lamps as opposed to LED work lamps have got a wider spectral range and I can see the real colours in this light. But what this does mean is that the pattern that you've just seen is caused by a variation in the thickness of this, as we said before, T, which is the thickness of the oxide film. Now there's no doubt that the thickness of the oxide film is the cause of the colours, but, but what these tests show is that because we've got lines with colours in them, we must be forming this oxide layer in a different way than what I'd originally anticipated. And whereas I thought that we might have to fiddle around with this surface here and build the layers up and down, I think that what we're doing, we're cutting into the surface and melting the surface. So we could either be melting the surface and when the surface re-solidifies, we're getting this oxide film on the surface or we're vaporising this area and we're leaving an oxide film on the surface within the groove. That's what it looks like from the pictures under the microscope, this second situation. This opens up many possibilities. First of all, if we're doing deep grooves like this, we're into one sort of heating situation and that is very possible because remember the beam that we're firing at the work, although it is only somewhere in the region of about 0.065 millimetres diameter, it is not 0.065 of uniform energy. The energy distribution in that beam is Gaussian. In other words, we've got a high power right in the centre of the beam and it drops away to nothing towards the outside. So that would account for why we've got a bit of a groove when we do our burn, and why we see these patterns of speckles which tend to be along the edge rather than the center. And we tend to get a bit of a black mark along the center of our line. <sighs> so observation tells me that we've got lots and lots of strategies to play with here now. As we found out from here, there are rules that govern these colours, and those rules are these very simple temperatures. So 
what we've got to do is find a way of somehow inducing these sorts of temperatures into the surface. Now, if we're melting, then mm, that's a bit interesting because you remember that when we heated this surface up in the middle here to red hot, it cooled down to blue. So I don't know whether melting, I don't know how melting is going to give us this yellow colour. I suspect we've got a very large thermal gradient away from where the actual beam is to the very small area around it. So I've got this problem of trying to work out how to keep the heat energy into a specific area. We've got to raise the temperature quite high to get some of these colours. Now, from some of the colours that I've seen other people achieve, they're not on this spectrum. But I suspect if we've got careful control, we may well have them somewhere in this spectrum. So the first thing I'm going to do is to see if I can replicate this approximate pattern. Now, as I said, it didn't go from gold to a lovely pale blue like this. It was quite a reasonable gold to um, a, a blue hue. We're not going to carry it out in a scattergun approach. We're going to be in. A, we're going to adopt a lot more logical approach and a recording approach to all the results and data that I'm finding. So I'm using my 304L stainless steel, and I'm going to be using that grid pattern and recording the data. Aha! Now what have I done here? I've got a temperature measuring system which will record the maximum temperature that I see and just here we've got a K-type thermocouple which I'm going to set in the centre of my engraving pattern. Now that little thermocouple bead there is sitting up above the surface so when I put my pattern there the thermocouple is touching under the centre of that square. So that means that I will now be able to record not the surface temperature, but I shall have an idea of the amount of heat energy that's going into each one of these tests by virtue of the conducted temperature onto the back surface. Now the reason I'm doing this is because it's not obvious sometimes that when you change the pulse width the frequency, the speed, exactly what you're doing. You have to sit down and think about it very carefully because it's quite a complex combination of data. And then you've got the other thing, which is the line width spacing between the scans and the pattern of the scans as well. So hopefully with the aid of the temperature data, we may be able to home in on some of these colors because the colors around the outside, the yellows and the browns around the outside are relatively low temperatures and the blues in the centre are high temperatures. So that would imply that we need to have a fairly high temperature in our scan to produce a blue. So the first test that we're going to do is the gold to blue test. So we'll jump down probably in intervals of 20 millimetres a second to see if we can find a pattern of change in the colour. So we do the first one or two just to show you the method and what I'm doing and then after that I will just plod away on my own and see what I can find, recording the data as I go and then coming back to you from time to time if I can find something that's interesting. I'm afraid that's as interesting as it gets. I think it's pretty obvious we've gone from a very, very pale gold, silvery colour almost, through browns to a sort of um, a purpley colour, and eventually down into a blue. It's not a strong blue, you have to catch it in the right light to see it as a blue, but that may well be because I've got the line spacing at the moment at point 0.1. I've got gaps between the lines. We'll repeat this test, but with a line spacing of 0 0.05, which is just below, supposedly, the thickness of the beam spot size. Even in this halogen light, it's still not as good as daylight. Well, if I hold it in the light right, <laughs> I've got a range of colours there, but they're, to be honest, they're pretty pathetic and weak colours, most of them. 
The golds and the browns are fairly positive, but it seems as though almost everything comes out gold or brown. So at the moment I'm not producing huge temperatures. You can see they're 31, 36, 38, 48. When I get to this latter set here, which was 0 0.01, in other words the spacing between the lines was very close, so I was overwriting several times the same spot almost. Then the temperature started to go up. It was 83 up to 132 and by the time we finished the test at 200 millimetres a second we're up to 199 degrees C. And you think oh 199 I should get a little bit of colour there I'm sure. As I feel it with my fingernail both of these colours D1 and D2 have suffered surface damage. I can feel a real depth to that cut. Okay it's not very much it might only be about 0.2 or 0.3 of a millimetre but there's definitely material missing from the surface now. So the only reason material can be missing from the surface is because we've evaporated it and if we've evaporated it we must have put a very very high surface temperature into there and in doing so is I suspect that we've gone beyond melting the surface and just allowing it to reform we may well have messed around with the chemistry of the material itself and in which case that would account for why these particular colours are more solid, more pigment like than the others. I mean the others are definitely they, they change very much with the light. Now I've got to be a little bit careful here because it's possible that when we come across these matte blacks and browns we're actually messing with the chemical composition of the steel itself. We're melting it and causing some elements to vaporise away and change the chemical composition of the surface and hence the colour. I don't think that these are representative of the colours that we're looking for. So we need to go hunting in a different area. We have found the golds and the browns and a hint of blue but we haven't got any other colours. Well, not entirely true. If we take a look at on my grid pattern there this is the top of the A that I've drawn in and here we can clearly see what I was speaking about earlier. The thin line down the centre where we've got maximum power at the centre of the beam and then round the edge here we've got the lower power which has given us the yellow or the goldy colour, very distinct browny yellow colour. This is a 6 nanosecond pulse, 400 kilohertz, a 0.1 line spacing so the line spacing is bigger than the spot size and it was done at 460 millimetres a second. Now you can clearly see there some of the some of the things that I've described to you before as I was expecting. We've got yellow spots on the side and we've got a black line down the centre where maximum power seems to exist. So there's our yellow grid line and here's what's supposed to be blue. We've got this black line right along the centre again which is the deep cut right at the centre of the beam. I don't see any blue in there and then we've got these markings on either side which if anything are a sort of a, a bit of a hint of yellow on them still. And that's a scan at 0 0.05 where the lines are probably just beginning to overlap but you can still see the black lines there which are the centre of the beam, the burn line on the beam. So we're burning into the material. So that's 10 microns spacing and all of a sudden we've lost the centre of the lines because I suspect that what we're doing there we're melting the surface and it's just flowing together. For the steel to melt it's got to be up to something like about 1400 degrees C and we've got to burn through the um, the oxide layer to start with which has got a melting point of about 3000 degrees C. Now we're not seeing anywhere near those sorts of temperatures projecting through to the back of a half mil sheet of material but we are getting up quite high at 199 degrees C when we do something like this. Yeah this is all interesting stuff but it's not getting me pinks and reds and greens. I've got good yellows, good golds, they seem easy to get. Well here I am in the office at the moment because it's a bit cold out in the workshop and I thought well I'll, I'll find an excuse to go inside in the warm and maybe I'll edit the material that I've done so far. 
it's sometimes great to stop and have a bit of a think because when your brain is running in a straight line sometimes it's got its own momentum and it can't stop well this is a natural break and it gives me an opportunity to look and review at what I've found so far now it's interesting when I look back and say um, this little shape here which is the cut seems to produce some sparkles on the side we seem to get color down the center and as you have watched this video already you'll understand what I mean now as I move through the video I mention sort of the fact that these colors here and the ones down here which were done at a much finer resolution first of all they're deeper which means we have evaporated material we've removed material but we've also um, it probably it looks as though we have destroyed the surface of the material as well when I get towards the end here and we start looking at the different line spacing that I've been using for some of these we find that there's my point one cut with the black heavy line down the center but you can see the little glittery bits on the side that are producing some color my thought was that that color was being produced on the side by the thin film effect because obviously we're not getting this thin film effect on a flat surface as I was getting with my oxide films when I heated the material up We've, we might have the same mechanism but it's not happening in the same way so for me to try and copy the thin film on the surface is not going to give me what we're looking for so I've got to look for some other mechanism and I'm finding the clues here now as I look back through these results so there we go look I've now moved on to a 0.05 pitch so the lines are so much closer together that's supposed to be a sort of a, a bit of a blue and in the right light it does show up as a pale blue a bit of a weak pathetic blue but it's still blue but then all of a sudden I change the the pitch between the lines to 0 0.01 10 microns and I get this weird effect which looks like a mat you know a piece of fabric or something it's very strangely textured the surface now that does not look like melting it doesn't look like anything that I can imagine except a piece of fabric as I sit here I think to myself fabric my wife loves iridescent fabrics iridescence butterfly wings scales I remember back to watching some very interesting scientific programs on that the color is not coming from the reflection of two surfaces it's coming from maybe two surfaces but a pattern of surfaces not just a single flat surface scales peacock feathers butterfly wings they're all made up of microstructures nanostructures of material which reflect the light in different ways so maybe as I sit here and look at that picture I'm looking at a clue to how these colors actually exist so we've gone beyond the possibility of producing these colors by a thin film interference pattern from a flat surface to maybe the same mechanism appearing on a geometrically repeating rough surface okay I'm live on the screen at the moment let me do a little bit of googling and see what we can find interestingly look iridescence it's still caused by thin film interference patterns we've got oil on water and we've got soap bubbles and here we look as though we've got butterfly wings or peacock feathers now I don't know what they are oh there's a peacock feather but this is what I'm interested in particularly this is what I do remember butterfly wings and over here look we've got this pattern which is a repeating pattern that causes iridescence it's reflections off of repeating surfaces so we've got not only one 
destructive or constructive um, reflection. We've got lots and lots of them mixed together. So here we've got some interesting data. This looks to be at a scale of about, on this basis, 10 microns, 0 0.01, which is the, exactly the area where I'm working at at the moment with that yellow gold pattern that all of a sudden appeared. I'm trying to get an idea now of what sort of surface we require to produce this effect because we've got a machine here which is capable of producing some very accurate and repeatable patterns on the surface. The real answer to how we can get colours, there will still be iridescent and changing colours <laughs> but they will be more solid than the strange colours that I've been able to get so far. So there's even a bit of a description here about how we're able to get colour from our little V grooves. It's no longer a matter of reflection off of a shiny top surface, but how can we produce a structured surface to reflect the light in the same way that these feathers and these butterfly wings do? Right, let's get to it. So I've gone for some extremes. We're going to do a speed of 2000, pulse of 2 nanoseconds, 850 kilohertz, and a pitch of one micron. Very, very fine pitch. Well, it's speckled, but it's gold. One of those easy colors to find. 2,000 millimeters a second means I'm actually spacing the dots out quite a lot. So although they are tight this way, I'm spreading them out that way. Now here I've got my calculation, my pulse rate chart, which tells me the scan speed against the number of pulses per minute, pulses per millimetre. Pulse, I've got the scan set to one micron, which is a thousand increments per millimetre, or a thousand scans per millimetre. So I did a quick test at a thousand scans in the other direction as well, which is 800 speed and that got me from gold to copper so maybe let's go right to the other extreme and go down to something like about 300 so now I'm doing nearly 3,000 pulses per millimeter across so now it's gone to a silvery grey you certainly didn't want to sit around and watch me doing all this stuff but hey look at C1 there that's a sort of olive green with a blue and a pink, and a dark magenta, gold, blues, pinks. For a change, I'm hand-holding the camera because I need to pan around this picture. We're looking at it in artificial light. I want you to watch these colors here, and I want to watch these pinks here. These blues, as I move around them, are changing. But the pinks are not. And some of the other colours are not changing. Well, that means there's a definite difference in the surface texture of the material. I think we're getting somewhere. Now, I have just remembered a very, very old friend. I'm going to have to go crawling around in my loft space and see if I can find it. Now look at this. Rust. <laughs> Dust. This is a piece of junk that I recovered from the scrap bin of a company that I worked for in Southern Ireland. It's a big American company and they used these on their production line. And when something went wrong with them, they literally just used to unclip them and throw them in the bin. When the stillage was full, it would be given to the scrap man. Well, I recovered several of them from the scrap bin and made this Franken microscope. And then I built my own base. <laughs> this was 40 years ago, remember, 1980. 
I thought it was too good to throw out at the time because the kids would make use of it looking for looking at bugs and various other things. They weren't particularly interested in it, so it sat up in a loft for years and years and years. Hey, who ever thought that I would be recalling the services of this good old friend? Even the silly little light work. They didn't have LEDs in those days. This is just a, a filament lamp. Now the interesting difference between these colours and the ones that I'd been finding previously, most of these colours do not change as you put the light into different directions. Whatever's happening now is definitely on the surface of this material. I'm hopeful that because this is a stereo microscope, I will be able to see exactly what the differences between some of these surface textures are. Oh, it's not an LED, so that light actually gets hot. Now the problem with this wonderful microscope is you can't see what I can see. I can only give you a little clue as to what I can see. If you take a look at the corner of that D there, that's just about what I can see in the microscope. That just gives you an idea of the magnification that I've got. Now, it's not a huge magnification, it's probably only about somewhere between 40, maybe 60 at the most magnification. Now this might not be a very exciting video for you, but all I can say is, wow. And now I'm going to take a look at one of the colours. Looking at the dark red mark, we've just got a few sparkly stars in the sky. Just a few with some green ones. When I move to this one, which is the slightly lighter mauvey pink, all I can say is, look, this is my wife's phone cover. That's what I'm seeing. Now I'm afraid I don't have an electron scanning microscope in my workshop that allows me to examine the surface of this in great detail. This Stone Age technology is about as close as I can get at the moment, but what we can do is to try and upgrade this with the aid of an HD camera so that you can see what I can see. But at 40, maybe 60 at the most magnifications with this lovely piece of kit, it's not enough for me to see the granular structure right on the surface of the material where the damage is taking place. Now, this looks like, at the moment, a crystalline structure. But I have got a little toy, a plastic toy microscope, which I've also used, which I won't even show you because I'm embarrassed about it. But it does show me that maybe there's a different picture to the one I'm seeing here with this device. At the moment I'm seeing what looks like a crystal type reflection, but it might not be that when we get down and have a real look at the surface. And to do that, I'm gonna to have to purchase a proper compound microscope that enables me to get to anything maybe between 200, 400, 600, or even a thousand times magnification so that we can really examine the surface and work out what damage this beam of light that we're able to control is doing to the surface. So we'll stop there for today and I'll thank you for your time and we'll catch up with you in a future session when we're suitably kitted up to reveal the secrets of this surface. Bye.